we're five minutes in. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, Joe, if you see anybody, just go ahead and let them in. Of course. All right. So thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. I know this is, uh, you know, right after 4th of July, so we'll keep it quick. And, uh, and then we will have some time for the uh, question and answer towards the end. But uh, yeah, once again, thank you for joining the call. Some of you are quite experienced uh, in syndication investing. Some of you are new to this, but whichever group you fall into, we're excited to share about this, uh, more about this property with you and answer any questions. So for the first 30 minutes, we'll go over the property details. And then after that, we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type it into the uh, comment section. Or, you know, if it's like urgent, you can just go ahead and, uh, you know, interject and, 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 and ask at any time. So here we go. Do you guys, can you guys all see the slide? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So this is a 53 unit apartment property and it sits on the 5.7 acre plus acre uh, with ample green space. There's a lot of um, parking space as well as basement storage area, which is like very rare in this uh, modern age. Um, it sits across from a uh, faces. Hey, Clint, how are you doing? Just let Clint in. And it sits is right across the street from Baker Park, which is a 60 acre park space. It's got miles of bike path, swimming pool, tennis courts, and then a beautiful, um, beautiful lake and outdoor concert stadium. It also hosts like a sporting events and kids activities all throughout the year. So yesterday, being that uh, it's a 4th of July, they had an all day activities, which ended with a firework finale and a parade. So it's definitely a place to be in uh, Frederick area. And this apartment literally is sitting right across from it. Um, so let me just go ahead and do a quick introduction to the, uh, the team uh, for you guys to kind of get to know us. I'm a uh, Michael Lin and I'm a managing a partner of Honeypot Investments. I've been investing in real estate for, I, I will say over 22 years, ranging in you know, various different sizes and types and also in different countries. Um, I, I'm also located in Northern Virginia. So Frederick is only about 35 minutes away of drive. So, you know, really close. And as much as I love investing in real estate, I also love helping others build true long-term wealth through syndication. So I'm really enjoying this process and meeting new investors. I have um, a, roughly about over 600 units after this acquisition. And um, moving on to uh, Raw Routine. He's uh, no longer, no stranger to the multifamily investing. He's my partner also in uh, Augusta, Georgia portfolio of over 350 units. Rob began uh, multifamily investing in early 2000 and uh, got into a lar larger complexes in the last decade with family office managing over 26,000 units. It has now branched out to create syndication opportunities for selected partners like us. And Rob is currently a general partner on eight properties, over 839 units, and limited partner on over 1,100 units. So moving on to Rachel Skillen. She is the beauty and the brain of our group. She's educated as a mechanical engineer and has been investing in real estate since 2002. And she currently owns and manages impressive portfolio of multifamily units, which many of them are actually located in Frederick area. And um, she has extensive experience in renovation process and she pays attention to every details with not just the numbers, but also every step of the project. So her help is gonna be vital in this project. And, and she has lived in Frederick for over 10 years. Am I right, Rachel? Yeah. All right. So moving on to Joe, last but not least. Joe, Joe is uh, our boots on the ground. He's, um, he, his office is located just literally stuffs, stone throw away. He's a Frederick native and far along in his asset management career. He's well connected, knows the market extremely well. He's currently running the most well received and reviewed PM firm in Frederick. And I've also known Joe personally and professionally for several years now. And he works as hard as anybody I know. So 
he's gonna he's gonna work his butts off to you know make the numbers work and and, and make sure we find the right tenants for for our property. Moving on to our extended partners, uh, we have Rob Crop. He's also a, a Frederick native and partner with our GP Joe Loman, and uh, they both together they own the Yaki City Property Management Company. Um, Rob also owns uh, one of the top uh, real estate brokerage firm in Frederick. So we got a good people on our side. And Chris Parcell, he is our general contractor with over 25 years of experience in commercial construction. And uh, he's also a Frederick native as well. So we have a lot of people on the uh, this team who knows the area. And he has built many things also in Northern Virginia and DC area where I'm at. So he's, uh, he's, he's you know, well experienced. And lastly, we have a Stu. Stuart, he's a second generation insurance broker and also my partner in multiple multi-family project. He will make sure our insurance is not only up to date, but also adequately insured. He's also an expert in Airbnb and short-term rental. So we will be exploring that avenue as we stabilize this property and um, you know get that going because that will give us a, quite a bit of uh, extra income. So. All right, moving on to uh, just the key investment details really quickly. This deal is structured for a long-term hole to maximize our return. So starting second year, 13th month of uh, ownership, we'll be targeting 6% preferred return. And you, you can see that we have a low initial cash on cash, but it's more than made up by, you know, really healthy um, average annual return of over like 26.7%, which basically means like your capital investment will grow by about 3.68 times in, in that 10 year frame. And depending on when we sell it or how long we hold it, that number will change. But, you know, it, it's a, our, my partners will go over that numbers in more detail. So uh, with that said, I'm going to hand over to Joe to talk about Frederick, Maryland. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it, man. Uh, hello, everyone. I am here to introduce you to Frederick, Maryland. For some of you that don't know, I know we got Rick, who's in Frederick. We got Rachel. We got Michael. Uh, we have Alex. Tons of tons of you are currently invested in Frederick. So for those of you who are not, I'm excited to introduce you to it. So Frederick is actually the second largest city in all of Maryland. It is fast paced and it is growing even faster. Uh, we have massive developments coming into the area. Uh, this could be an example of uh, Riverside. The Riverside development is 1 million square feet of both biotech and just technology development and research. Uh, this facility is 3.3 miles from uh, Parkview Apartments, and that is slated to be completed in late of 2024. Um, Frederick is, you know, year over year growth for household income is seeing a bump of 2.5% every single year. But with the past year, 2021, we've seen a significant bump. This can be addressed in the fact that we have 26,000 small businesses here in Frederick County, right? Those all come to Frederick City to make their ends meet, right? So we have 26,000 businesses with less than 10 employees, all within Frederick. Frederick is slowly becoming a shipping hub, a, a business hub, and a tech hub all in one. And um, this is all attributed to the growth and the, the, the development of the surrounding area. Um, there's an entrepreneurial spirit in Frederick that just keeps it growing. Um, so just as an example, Amazon wanted to put a fulfillment center here, and we moved it up to Hagerstown, but that's just to go to show that if Amazon can find statistics like if you live in Frederick, Maryland, you are an eight-hour drive in any direction to 50% of the U.S. population. That, I find, is a staggering uh, statistic. Uh, just because of the reach that you have. If you have spoken to anyone who has lived on the East Coast, most likely they've been or heard of Frederick, Maryland. Um, now we're going to go to 56. This is what's nice. 56% of all household income is above the $75,000 mark. Um, we beat on every single metric up until a quarter of a million dollars, the national average, meaning that not only do we have enough people with qualified income to support this housing need, but we also have a lack of housing, right? Currently in the Frederick market, we are experiencing two months of inventory for that housing inventory to regulate, to become more of a buyer's market. We need to see 12 months of inventory. Currently we are far behind on development 
on, on just transactions alone. Uh, this year, we've already started off 17% slower than we have in 2021, and everyone knows that it was very hard to find a house in 2021. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you guys some amenities of Frederick. So here we have downtown Frederick, and that is Carroll Creek. Carroll Creek was a $30 million development that was done by a couple of, uh, couple of demolition crews that basically came through and said that there was you know, too much water in Baker Park. So they slapped in a $30 million uh, water easement and that slowly became a hub for everyone to gather around. What you're seeing in the top photo is a live at five from April till September of every single year, every Friday at 5 p.m., more than 45,000 people come through Frederick just to witness a live at five, right? We have live bands, happy hours, uh, new restaurants coming in, food trucks that deliver all over the city, right? Then you have down at this bottom middle photo, that is actually Baker Park, right? That's Baker Park proper. That tower is called the Joseph D. Baker Memorial. The property that we have the Parkview Apartments is on was originally owned by Joseph D. Baker. Uh, I just think that that's a nice little thing to throw in there. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So here you have it. This is the... the the pinnacle of why we're doing this, right? You have the Parkview Apartments down there circled in lime green, and that abuts right next to Baker Park. Baker Park is no, no kidding across the street from the Parkview Apartments. Uh, then you have Color Lake, which draws kids and, and families from all around Frederick. Annually, they do a trout launch where they just, you know, put in a bunch of trout and let kids under the age of 12 all fish there, and they're all accompanied by their parents. So it's a great way for them to see what we've been doing and, and building onto this, this, uh, this apartment building. Um, up in the top circle, circled in yellow, you see the downtown Frederick hub, right? It starts on East Patrick Street and goes all the way up to 16th Street. Um, this is full of nightlife, regular businesses, great atmosphere. We are the second largest city in all of Maryland, but truly to be in Frederick, you, you want to feel like you're in a small town. And that's what Frederick does for me, for everyone that I know, everyone that I've ever sold houses to in Frederick. We try to keep it a small family town. Um, to the next slide, please. Here's our competition, right? All the people that pitch the idea of living on Baker Park, right? They, they pitch the idea of you're living in Frederick, you're, you're having a great time. Um, but one thing that they cannot produce is a view of Baker Park, right? That's the one thing that we have over all of them. And they all, of course, admire the fact that they're in Frederick, but out of locations, you can see by we are the starred location. We are the only property truly on Baker Park. So here I'll go over a quick property statistics. Of course, we have 53 units. We have 40,037 square feet of rentable square footage. We have a $2.2 million CapEx budget. The average one bedroom rent in the near vicinity of two miles, which of course down draws our actual average rent for the city is $1,440. Our average two bedroom rent within two miles is $1,668. We've been blessed with the current management and ownership of this property to have them leave us a 97% occupancy rate upon switching hands. But that comes with the side to add to value add. We now have average one bedroom rents at 925 and the average two bedroom rent at 975. The total purchase price per door is of course landing at $122,000. But after the sale of the land lots that we have agreed to, it is now $85,000 a door. Michael, I believe that does it for me. So I will now turn it over to our trusted advisor, Rachel. Rachel, take it hey. away. Hey, everybody, I'm Rachel. I'm here to give you a brief introduction of what our business plan is gonna be for this project. So you've already heard some details about it. Um, it is currently being run by the current owners as a 55 and above community. That is elective, not mandatory. And their current rent rates are significantly below market, at least $300 per unit. The units themselves are a little bit dated. And one of the big design features, if you can call it a feature, is that they are currently heated by a single boiler system. And that boiler system is maintained, operated, and fully paid for by the current owners. 
So that obviously is a very significant overhead expense that the current ownership is up against. And in addition to the boiler system, none of the units actually have internal air conditioning. So we're, we're looking at older units here where the bones are great, the building's great, the location is great. So the first phase of our business plan is going to be to remove the elective age restriction and do an across the board rent increase for all of the existing occupants. This alone is going to raise our rent base significantly, but in addition, there are storage units in the basement that are currently not being rented out for a fee. And we also have um, covered parking spots that are currently just being filled at first occupancy. We are going to plan to label those lots and rent them out to the tenant base as well. But these simple improvements without any renovation done to the property at all are going to immediately increase the property's net operating income by at least $80,000 a year. And this is before we've even done any renovation. So that'll bring me to step two of our business plan, which is the renovation portion. Now we've already been working with and we've been in the design process with a very reputable local company called Contour Construction, and we've hired them to be our GC for this project. So we currently have a $2.2 million budget to do this renovation with. And Michael, if you could please slide to the next, the next slide for me, I'll be able to talk a little more in detail about what we're planning to do with this money. So you can see lots of line items and lots of detail here, but if you stick to the big numbers, and you look at the top right, you'll see that we have a significant cost involved in our electrical and our HVAC systems. Currently, the units are operating on 60 amp panels. And the first major upgrade we're going to do is to heavy up the entire building. Each unit will now have a new 125 amp breaker panel dedicated on its own meter in each unit. So these new panels at 125 amp amps have tons of space for us to install some new mini split systems. We are going to abandon the boiler system as the heating source and install three zone mini splits in each unit, allowing each resident to have their own independent controls of heating and now have the additional feature of cooling, which let's face it, if we're going to be looking at bringing rents up to market, air conditioning is mandatory in Frederick, Maryland. So those are the most significant cost upgrades. Uh, we're gonna do some other smaller renovations. So. Michael, if you could scan to the next slide for me so I can talk a little bit about those details. Okay, great, thank you. So here on the left side, you're gonna see our before pictures. Obviously you can see that the kitchens as they are right now are, are perfectly sufficient from a rental standpoint. But again, if we're gonna really capitalize on the top of those market rents, we need to make sure that we're bringing these kitchens up to the standards that a higher paying 2022 market tenant has come to expect. So we have plans in our budget to replace all of the kitchen cabinets. We're gonna be putting in solid surface countertops and doing some other amenity upgrades within the kitchen. Those are gonna be somewhat significant. The bathrooms, if you see on our bottom left here, they're actually really cute as they are. They're retro, the building is older, but it's been maintained very well. So what we plan to do with our bathrooms is just some little facelifts, some little updates to bring them up to, again, current tenant expectations. So when we factor in after the renovation that we're gonna be able to then capitalize on this full difference of rent rate and take these units easily up 400 a month from where they are right now, Post renovation, when we occupy these with new tenants, we are going to be looking at a rent increase that is equal to at least $230,000 a year that goes straight to our net operating income. And with our loan as it is, we already have the cost of this renovation factored in. So that's not gonna be increasing our loan costs at that time. That's purely gonna be extra income that we have to work with. And that's just step two. <laughs> Step three, if you could go to our next slide, is the really fantastic part of this project. So as it is right now, Parkview Apartments has an absolutely picturesque front lawn. It's beautiful, it looks like a college campus. And while that's lovely, it's also a great opportunity. The current owners have been working on a subdivision process with the city of Frederick that is allowing us to complete the development of 10 to 11 single family house lots. 
as you'll see along the bottom of the screen. Now, the most important thing about these lots is a, a frontal Baker Park lot is really hard to come by. These are the last lots available in Frederick that are actually buildable with a full park view. Ironically named Parkview Apartments. So <laughs> what we plan to do is continue on this development process. It's going to take about 18 to 24 months to complete. But upon completion, we will be planning to sell these 10 to 11 lots to a developer for a minimum proceed of $2.5 million. And that's truly a conservative number. So at that point, 18 to 24 months down the road, we proceeded with our renovation. We're gonna take those proceeds from the lot sales and feed it back into the property. And then we're gonna to come to our very last step of our business plan, which is going to be a HUD refinance. So we are gonna to go to the government now that we have a fully functioning, renovated, good quality property with a very low loan to value and refinance the entire property into long-term financing with HUD. Now this, this offers a lot of features, the security of the rate, the long-term financing, but what it really does is it allows us to pull out all of the improvements we've done in the form of cash and return it to all of our investors. So at that point, you're going to not only be getting back your principal investment, but you're going to be getting all your profit, your capex, and capital returns, anything that you have earned from a profit standpoint while we've been pouring the money back into the property will be paid back to you fully but you're still going to preserve your ownership interest in the property. So at that point, you're going to have no money into the project and still be an owner based on the percentage of your capital contribution to the investment. So I don't want to give away too much. This is the fun part. I wish I was talking about it, but Rob is our resident expert at the numbers. So I'm going to hand it off to you now, Rob. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rachel. Michael, if we can get on to the next slide. So this is the fun part. This is the questions that everybody wants to know, the numbers. Parkview is 53 units and we're purchasing this thing for $6.25 million. That is the final negotiated price. We are raising 3.5 million on a first come first serve basis. I'm gonna go into details in the loan on the next slide in a second, but there is a three to four year hold period in which we're gonna be doing our business plan and moving toward the refinance. So just keep in mind that before you start getting your money back, it will be three to four years from now, maybe sooner, maybe a little bit later, all dependent upon market conditions. We are going to be using all of the income on the property to improve the property. Our preferential payments is 6%, which is what we're offering, is gonna start being calculated in year two, starting on the 13th month. The first year, honestly, you can take a look at the rents, 925 per month for the ones, 975 for the twos. At 950 a month with these renovations, we could raise more money, lower your cash on cash and start returning money back to you, but that really does not make any sense. Let's have the property actually start to make money and get real returns going on. As Rachel mentioned, the, the big thing is the proceeds from the land sale, which we're estimating at $2.5 million. We are going to complete hopefully that sale right before we start the refinance so that we can roll the proceeds of the land sale into the refinance. Michael, the next slide for the debt, please. And the debt is very advantageous to this investment. Our total loan amount is $4.5 million, which is 75% loan to cost on the property. So that purchases Parkview. The lender is funding us 2.2 million additional for the capital expenditures, which is going right into the business plan. So the total loan is $6.7 million. We are very fortunate right now, considering in this turmoil of interest rates in the Fed, we currently have a 4.45% interest rate. It could go up before closing, but it doesn't look like it, but it still could happen. And it's still gonna be well below five. We are getting 24 months of interest only. That allows us to maximize the use of our funds repairing the property and not paying out just straight to a mortgage. And the best part, it's fixed for five years. So we have some stability on a very advantageous sub 5% interest rate mortgage that's going to float us locked in this time of uncertainty in the rest of the market. And that's, that's going to be very advantageous. And all the payments are based upon a 30-year amortization. Next slide, Michael, please. The financial, the financial 
analysis is available on the investor deck. But really, I want to talk about two very important things here. One, we're keeping our vacancy rates pretty high on this because we're doing renovations. We're going to have to empty out a building or two at a time. So that's not going to help out with occupancy numbers. So our vacancy is going to increase. And we took that already into account. We're also aiming for the average of $14.50 per month of rents, which is currently today's average in the market within two miles, to achieve that by year three. That's being very conservative on these numbers. So we're not stating what a lot of people end up stating, oh, we're going to raise rents immediately in the first year to $14.50. Well, you can't because you haven't renovated all the units. It takes time for the general contractor to go through there and to conduct the business plan. So we can honestly say that it will be done by the third year and we can hit that 1450 by the third year or higher because we're gonna take into consideration the income at the third year. Next slide, Michael, please. We're using a $100,000 example for our investor return simply because it's simple math. If you notice in the third year refinance, we're returning 100% of initial capital returned back to the limited partners. That will be basically because we sold the land, the increase in the value of the property, we're gonna be able to give you back all of your initial capital. We're also gonna pay back any deficiencies on the cash on cash over years two and year three. We do say that, yeah, it's a 2.5% cash on cash return during the hold, which means that we're gonna have some deficiencies that we're gonna be owing you at the time of refinance. So just take that into consideration that by that time, you're gonna be paid back in full. All payments will be sent out quarterly. And if we do that return of everything and made you whole in the third year, you're now gonna be owning this property without any money in it and your returns are infinite. You're gonna be receiving quarterly checks based upon your ownership percentage on the profit of this property. We did take it into consideration for 10 years because our analyzer only goes up to 10 years. So we're going to assume a sale. That doesn't mean that we're going to sell it because we could refinance within that period and distribute the loan proceeds. Loan proceed distribution is not taxable. So keep that in mind. But if our analysis goes down into the worst case scenario that prices are slow to grow by 10 years, we're still hitting a three times equity multiple. If we're being very optimistic, we're going to be returning back four times equity multiple on, on your money. So our current projection is right smack in the middle at 3.68. Next slide, please. And here's the summary of your returns. This is what, why we're all going to invest in this. We are offering a 6% cash on cash return, non-cumulative year over year. All profits are gonna be distributed 80% to the limited partners and 20% to the general partner. The general partnership team has stakes in limited partners. So we're on your side of the boat as well. So every single property that I have ever general partnered in, I'm a limited partner as well. Because I wanna make sure that if the property for some reason stabilizes or goes south or profits, I'm on the same boat as you guys. The big thing to keep in mind here if at the refinance, we return 100% of initial capital, so all of your money's back, all your preferential returns are made whole, there's going to be a split change from 80-20 to 70-30. So everything at that point will become a 70-30 split moving forward. Notice you're still going to have infinite cash on cash returns. If there are any loan proceeds at the time of refinance, those are split 80-20. So you still get back the majority of the loan proceeds. We're estimating a 10 year hold, but that does not mean that we're gonna hold it for 10 years. We could hold it for shorter, for longer. It really depends upon market conditions. We could get an investor come in and offer us a price that's crazy and he takes it, or we can just refinance in years seven, eight or nine and pretty much take in some free money and continue holding this essentially forever. Now Michael's going to talk about the key dates and things to keep in mind moving forward. Thank you, Rob. All right. So just a quick summary of the key dates. Um, 
at this point, you can do, and if you haven't done so, uh, submit a soft commit. So what does that do is that it's showing us that how much money or how much funds you're planning on investing. If you're not sure if you want to um, invest in X, you know, X amount, I would suggest putting in a higher number. So what essentially this does is kind of reserve the spot for you so that uh, we know how uh, these uh, capital rates are allocated through our investors. Then once you do the soft commit, then you'll receive a, a contract called private placement memorandum, PPM. And take a look at that, you know, give yourself time because it's quite long. And once you've read it, signed it, then you can wire the funds and secure your spot. So the way to secure your investment spot is to make sure you sign the PPM and then wire the funds afterwards. You can do this uh, through several ways, you know, file it or sign it as an individual or sign it as a married couple or sign it as an LLC, as a firm. So, you know, just kind of talk to your CP about that. You can also use uh, your retirement fund like the uh, 401k or the uh, um, IRA to do this but it has to be a solo 401k or self-directed IRA. So that setup takes about several weeks to a month and sometimes even more. If you're planning on doing that, uh, I would advise you to get on the ball. We can uh, point you to the right direction on who to call to get that happen. Uh, we have some investors here on the call who have, who have done that exact same thing. So, uh, mm -hmm. but it does take time. So make sure you, know, you, you get on the ball quickly. So at this time, um, we are going to wrap up the uh, presentation and open up the, um, the forum for Q&A. You guys can unmute yourself and then ask any questions you like. I don't see any uh, questions typed on the chat. So, um, you know, open uh, question forum is good. I think that just means we did a stellar job. <laughs> so this is Rick. I've got a couple of questions. Um, you know, you, your comps are against good class A properties. I did drive by this the other last week, just to try to take a look at it. Um, to become a, so are you planning on, it, it, nothing's in your budget, so I'm assuming the answer is no, but there's no other amenities planned. Um, there's no, uh, there was a bullet on one of your slides about, you know, opening up a living room wall that kind of create a nice environment. So are any of those planned in the budget? I'd like sure. to take this one. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay, guys. Yeah. So yeah, I did rush over the renovation a little bit quickly because I didn't want to get into details. But yes, we're going to be taking out a wall that currently separates the dining area from the kitchen area, which is going to open up the floor plan a lot. And it'll also add a little bit of space for some additional base cabinets. So that definitely will modernize the floor plan and make us more comparable to a class A property. Now, if I'm just going to scroll through on my other screen here to go to the rent comps, because on the slide when Joe went into the rent comps, the average one bedroom was 925 and the average for the area was 1440. So that is actually, gosh, give me do math under pressure. Is that a $515 difference? We're not taking it that whole way. We're not going to pretend that we're going to be a class A property. Yeah. I referred to a $300 increase instead of the 515. So we, we've already factored that in. And of course we would love to add amenities, but when we did the math and the return on adding a swimming pool or adding any of these features, it just didn't make any sense. We are what we are. We also have assets that they don't have, which is the proximity, the location, access to Baker Park. So we're just gonna look at being a good solid B plus. Okay. Uh, and I probably only just have really one other question. Um, Baker Park proximity is a huge advantage. How did you factor in into your pro forma um, any, any implications of having the high school basically in your backyard? Joe, would you like to answer this? Uh, I would love to. Um, so as you may know, Rick, um, you also have um, Hood College, right? Hood College is on College Terrace. Where are some of the most expensive houses in downtown Frederick? They're on College Terrace, right next to Hood, right? So Frederick High School just went through a massive renovation and revamp budget, right? They updated a bunch of features and facilities all throughout their school. Currently, right, as you may have gone and seen that Grove Boulevard looked like it dumped right out 
onto our property, right? What the current ownership has in fact done is put a quick claim deed so that way the school can no longer exit children and students out the back way of the college, right? Because they knew that that would affect their current 55 and up strategy, right? It would, it would impede their tenants' quiet enjoyment. So they went through, did a quick claim deed, got Grove Boulevard entirely deeded to the property, right? In which the only usage for that property is evening bus drop-offs, right? So it, it lessens the load quite, quite a lot, as well as, you know, the revamp of Frederick High School. Yeah, but are there any limitations, you know, through ordinance or any other legal limitations associated with having a school that close? Does it create any restrictions on the property itself in any way? Not on the property. I mean, again, we could delve into uh, potential tenants, but again, those would be avoidable. And right, yeah, I mean, sure, yeah, if you had a you know, somebody yep. on the sexual, yeah, uh, yes, on a bad list, yeah, yeah. So we have calculated that, and we have we have considered it as you know you would say, uh, depending on what it is, is this good or is this bad? Having a revamped high school with all sports facilities and everything brand new in the backyard definitely does not hurt. And sorry, I do have one. Joe, is, I assume is your management company that'll be managing this property or who's managing yeah. it? Yes, sir. Proud and, proud and true. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick uh, note on the, uh, the renovation update too. So the kitchen wall, and then we're looking into the basement uh, storage area to make that a little bit nicer. There's also a county incentive of uh, free um, uh, electrical charge station. Oh, yeah. So I believe Kelly Timko has added a question, and her yep. question was, can you share the flood plan for the area, floodplain map, I'm assuming? So Kelly, uh, of course, we can send this out to everyone based upon the investment, you will have no problem finding that in our offering. We will uh, submit that immediately. Um, but if your concerns are, does this affect the property? No, it does not. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks on that. I just know Baker Park is the flood plain for the for Carroll Creek. <laughs> yes, so, it, it is in fact. Uh, so there's no overrun of flooding or there's no in the design i haven't looked at the design obviously into the property or the subdivided properties that is I'd the actually key. like to take this one joe not an issue <laughs> <laughs> he's getting used to being interrupted by me at this point i think <laughs> so the current engineering company that has been doing the design of the subdivision of lots that they have here's my cat uh, they have identified a small section of the frontal lots that is impacted by the flood schedule. But that is something that we can build up with Phil. We're going to have the engineering company take a look at that and just backfill it up. And then FEMA is going to run the new study. So it, it does technically affect it, but it's a very small aspect. I can send you the flood maps. I can send you all the details off of there. So just, uh, I guess, uh, asking some of the locals back in the 2019 flooding, um, was the basement flooded here at all? or uh, do you not, not aware? It wasn't built then. So no, the basement didn't flood in 2019. No, no, I'm talking oh. about the existing apartment units. The, the, I noted that there oh. was a basement in there and just noting that it's right outside the flood pane. I, I know a couple of years ago, there was some severe flooding in Frederick and Baker Park. Uh, did that hit the, uh, the basement or was it, does anyone know, I guess? So so throughout all of their insurance claims that they've handed over to us, there was no flood from 2019. And I know the flood that you're talking about, the one that destroyed East Patrick Street. Uh, that's the we, one. That's the one. We were, this property was thankfully unaffected by that. The front, and again, Rachel can share with you the flood map, the actual effect of Carroll Creek on this property, it dumps into Baker Park and we are on an uptrend on the other side. So a corner, a sliver of one of the lots, lot seven of our of our development actually had water on it, but was not was not affected. The owner of it actually, their house was on Third Street. Their house got destroyed, um, but this did not. And and Jim, I can share the elevation information with you as well if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, that'll that'll come through hopefully in the flood in the floodplain. Just um, uh, I guess there was a, another question on on the partner the 
I guess the insurance, the contractor, and the, the what, what is the relationship between them? You just noted that they're partners. Are they GPs? Are they LPs? Are they, what, what is their relationship? At this time, they're a third party subcontractor. They're not involved as a GP or LP. Okay, so oh, there's so no carried interest or anything there for those, those people? Not at this time. So I mean, they, they're like still open like everyone else to become an LP if they wish. So I can't guarantee they won't join in on the party. What what is their relationship then? They're just their. Uh, We've entered uh, into contract. a third party subcontractor agreement for an initial design build plan. Okay. And the insurance agent is the insurance agent providing the insurance for the property. Did that get bid out or quoted or you know how does that work? Yeah, yeah we we, had... we took it to multiple bids. I'll let Michael. And yeah, we had multiple bits. And also Stuart and I have a partner in different properties together. He does a lot of my insurance and in, uh, my other properties. So, um, yeah, so he's... That, that just tells me there's a bias. But anyway, yeah, go. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we... So it's um, when you are selecting insurance agencies, there are things that they don't tell you. For example, like 1%, 2%, 5% hail storm coverage. And Stuart has been a lot more transparent and open about these things. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a also, year Jim so. and Kelly, I had my insurance companies quote and they couldn't they couldn't compete with these guys. So I tried. <laughs> oh yeah, I just know, yeah, fees for insurance is not transparent at all. So that's that's well noted. Yeah, yeah. Also, and also, you know, Stuart is an insurance broker. So the insurance companies that are insuring our properties are big you know, national companies, right? Like state farms or, you know, all state. So it's, it's, we're not, we're not getting the insurance coverage from a small third company or. Yep. And it's good to have a relationship with an insurance agent when you're doing commercial brokerage for larger properties, because any slight mistake on, on the actual underwriting process or writing up with the insurance claim if something were to happen, it could delay the insurance company from paying out. Mm -hmm. So if the insurance agent understands what it is that you're doing, then it sort of becomes a, a good partner to have because they're going to write up the policies correctly. You know, the quick question, the 10 lots that you've got outlined that uh, would be sold, um, so we call it 250 grand a piece on average. Um, are those, do you have a developer in mind? Do you have, do you already have uh, likely candidates to purchase that or, you, or has that been approached yet? Can I, can I take this one? Sure, sure. go ahead, Joe. Okay, so be it Maryland real estate law, we technically have this property under contract. We cannot negotiate a, a post sale of these okay. lots, right. but Word to the wise, there is grave interest in just these lots alone. There's also grave interest in just the, the apartment building alone. Um, again, so far, and I just got word today, uh, we have one of the lots uh, pretty much agreed to to be sold for $250,000 as a, as a base agreement, right? So that's, that's the starting. The, the most recent comparable to Baker Park lots being sold with infrastructure and not housed just with water, electric, and sewer, uh, sold for $525,000 a lot. And that was back, the last sale for that was 2016. So Joe, you're looking, are these, you're looking at pro individual purchasers? It could be 10 different purchasers for these properties then. So, so what we would do, right, to ascertain, again, that baseline, like that is baseline price of two two point five million million, that would be wholesaling these lots out with approvals. Um, again, that, that end user or the, the middleman user, the, the builder, will then have the opportunity to go and price out these lots with infrastructure and then sell them to either, uh, these are obviously going to be spec homes. You're not going to go in there and get cookie cutter homes. These are going to be spec build. Um, although the covenants, and I'm happy to say this, the covenants for these 10 lots are the exact mirror of West 2nd Street uh, or East 2nd Street, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that those are the last five Baker Park lots that were sold. And those are actually behind the tennis court and 
a, a block off of Baker Park. They don't have a park view necessarily. Okay, and Rick, I just wanted to add one more thing to what Joe said there. We did look at that. We did look at the possibility of selling the lots independently. Uh, and while it would probably return a higher return on our investment, it also could take extra time <clears throat> because you know you might sell three or four, you might have to wait six months for the rest. There's no, there's no set time when you're going to be able to recoup all that money. So that's why we were a little bit conservative on the sale of it to leave something on, on the meat on the bone for the uh, developer, decrease the price and know that we're gonna get them sold all at once so that we can focus on our main business plan. Our main business plan is the property and operating the property, not maximizing the profit by selling the lots independently. But we did run through that analysis and look at the math for that and, and chose accordingly. Thank you. So sorry to, to, to clarify there, Rachel. So that's already been ag agreed to be sold as one. I got a little bit confused during the, the previous discussion. That's already well, been agreed. Or just estimated? As much as can be agreed at this point, market conditions change. And if in three years we're looking at an absolutely monster hot resale market where people are building all over the place, maybe we reevaluate at that point. But we did make an agreed assumption to sell it as a bundle so that we could create a scenario we can base our math on. So, yeah, I'm just so that's an assumption for the financial model, not a it's not there's not contracted or it's not not guaranteed no. that it has to go together. That's just the baseline assumption. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Or yeah, you got correct? it. That's correct. Okay, So it's just an assumption that that's fine. The, the business plan or was it evaluated developing it uh, yourselves or as part of this? Yeah, we we did run through that evaluation. In fact, it's a little funny because I was very pro development, but you know, when I'm 25% of a team, I don't always get my way. So we did, we looked at the math, we looked at it in detail. I, I looked at it in probably more detail than most people wanted me to look at. Uh, and we made a group decision to proceed focusing on the business plan as we've got it right now. Uh, Jennifer White asked um, if we can repeat what type of IRA accounts can be used to invest. Uh, Self-directed IRA accounts and solo 401k accounts would be the, the best to do it. Um, employer 401k accounts are not, they've got too many restrictions as to what you can and can't invest in. Um, solo 401ks are honestly easier. Self-directed IRA accounts, uh, because you can choose any type of investment that you want to get into. The one thing I will forewarn about self-directed IRA accounts is that you will be subject to UBIT taxes. Um, consult your independent tax advisor and your tax preparer on how that will affect you and in your current economic situation, because that's Pandora's box for me to go into at, at this time. But you're looking at self-directed or solo for, or a solo 401k. So I put a link here in the chat forum uh, of uh, solo401k.com. And if you reach out to them, they can do both the uh, self-directed IRA or solo 401k. Thank you, Michael. Yep, thank you. How many investors are you targeting if you think you'll have? It's a first come first serve basis of 3.5 million. Uh, honestly, I believe we have 2.6 available right now so this is going pretty pretty well paced so there's and, and, and as passive investors we would be subject to whatever decisions you as the management group make with respect to what you sell when you sell it so on yes and we are and we are basically fiduciaries because this is a 506b offering the the sec is taking a look at this because it is a it is not a public offering, so, so, so it's not a stock. So it's an unregistered opportunity and the SEC is gonna be receiving paperwork. That's the PPM that you're gonna be receiving. That's the, the subscription agreement that you're gonna be receiving. That's the company agreements that you're gonna be receiving. All that is being filed with the SEC. So basically, yeah, you do have to, you're more than welcome to voice out and opinion. And honestly, I've had that happen in, in the past where an investor has said, are we taking a look at selling this property right now because of current market conditions? 
Um, and I'm glad to answer any of those questions within our, our whole time because I do value other people's opinions, but to a large degree, yeah, we are managing this property upon your behalf for it because you are being a limited partner, but we have to be fiduciarily responsible to you and, and to your money. So we just can't go out there and decide to buy this and then just take the money and go buy a, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini and say, thank you very much and keep the property unrenovated. No, we do have to follow the business plan. We have to move forward accordingly. And honestly, there are bad boy clauses within the SEC that if we don't perform the way that we told that we were performed, now, of course, can a property go sideways? Yes. Um, can things happen? Yes. Um, I tell people a meteorite can come down and destroy four, you know, four buildings and the insurance company might not cover it. Um, is it going to happen? Honestly, I'd say probably not. But could it? Yeah, it's an extreme example. But things can pop up the market can turn sideways. So we are trying to be as responsible as humanly possible for your investment. And, you know, as I said, I'm also on the limited partner side and other general partners are also on the limited partner side. So if this thing goes belly up, we're losing money too. Sure. Hey guys, this is Brad. Can you talk about operational costs going away from the boilers? And are tenants um, paying any utilities now or going forward? <laughs> um, I'll touch on that one, Rachel, if you want, or, or do you want to take it? I'll, I'll take it. Um, right now, the tenants are not on a rub system at all. So they're not paying for any type of utilities on, on this property. The boilers are roughly costing the current owners about $50,000 a year in natural gas. And when we did our due diligence walkthroughs in April, it was a beautiful 75 degree day. We walked into a couple of the units and it was literally 80, 85 degrees. So there was no control of the radiator heat going in there to the tenants. And that is where we're burning up a lot of money. So we are going to move over to the mini split systems so that one, a tenant can control their own comfort. So if they wanna have it 90 degrees in the dead middle of January, feel free. If their neighbor wants it at 50 degrees, feel free. Um, they have much more control over it than trying to turn a knob on a radiator system. So we're expecting that natural gas cost to plummet once all the renovations are completed because we have many split systems at 53 units. The only thing that we're gonna be eating is the central hallways. Is the, uh, is, are, are the mini split systems the same uh, capacity for a one bedroom as a two bedroom? No, they're gonna be slightly different and Rachel's taken a look into the actual capacities between two and three zone systems. Yeah, well, when we're obtaining our permits, they have to do a heat load calculation based on square footage, certain assumptions about thermal transfer through the walls. So the math will tell us what size to put in and the permit will govern that process. So they will be sized properly. So a saving in, in gas costs, but tenants will still not be assuming any utility, paying for any utilities going forward. Um, well, they actually will because these new systems are running off of our new panels. It's one of the driving factors on upgrading the service on the panel so that each unit is individually metered and their individual mini split system is powered by their panel. So all of the heating and cooling costs are now being paid for by the tenant. Okay. So operation costs dropping plus the pain. So it should be a, quite a big savings there. Yep. Yep. In natural gas costs alone, we're expecting a $30,000 a year drop. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you guys have that in the model, I assume. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I think we only dropped it in half to about a $20,000, 20, $20,000 a year drop. Because Again, running everything extremely conservatively. Do we have any more chat questions? Anything now, else? We got one more chat question. 
Are there yep. any restrictions for purchase of the subdivided properties to LPs or GPs? If you want all 10, you can <laughs> have it. <laughs> you can have it, buddy. I just told now you. Now I know price. why you're asking so many questions. Yeah. What do you want, man? <laughs> Come talk to us after all the approvals are done with the city, and we'll talk about the subdivided land if you're interested. Yep. There you go. The, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, as we move forward to feel free to ask us any question, reach out to any one of us. Um, we're obviously available um, starting today to whenever and uh, just keep those uh, dates in mind. And if you guys need any help or clarify anything, um, also, Joe and I are very close by. So if any of our investors want to do a walk, you know, walk the property or just hang out in Frederick, please uh, feel free to give us a call. I am a three minute drive from this property. Just so everyone's aware. And I also know where Joe's- For your, for your I, participation too. These have been some fantastic questions, and great discussion. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've had a great time. And I appreciate it. They put us to the test, huh? <laughs> no. Anyway, um, no more questions. No one wants to raise their hand. Still got 23 people in here. Not one question. All right, looks my like favorite, we're good. My favorite color is blue. I don't know. What else you want to know? <laughs> All right, good. Well, we're one hour into it, and I want to be respectful for everybody's time. So let's wrap this up right here. And uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Thank you so much for uh, showing up tonight and uh, giving us your you know, much valued time. Talk Thanks soon, everybody. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for Thank you for coming. Anytime.